Uh, it's Sean Capstick speaking, and uh, I am very happy to um, be presenting here on climate change adaptation and our experiences here in Canada in the mining sector. Um, as Anna Maria mentioned, we've done a lot of work um, for uh, the mining sector in Canada with adaptation. And uh, what uh, we are trying to do at Golder, we have the technical community to share knowledge amongst ourselves um, on how to, to uh, do this. How do we um, plan for the future when uh, the future has a lot of uncertainty and unknowns? And we have developed through our experience some uh, approaches and best practices uh, to do that. And I'd like to expand on that um, uh, in our experience here in Canada as part of a series for uh, mining adaptation that the IAIA is putting on. So the first um, thing, just to set the stage, when we talk about climate change, um, Right now, what we want to focus on is climate adaptation, um, which is focusing on identifying and avoiding the potential impacts of a changing climate. This is complementary to other very important areas dealing with climate change, uh, both in terms of mitigation. Uh, the GHG carbon services, whether you, where you're doing your accounting and mitigation activities, and then especially in energy, um, services for mining. Mining is very um, uh, energy intensive and um, the uh, mining um, uh, process for energy is um, uh, important. But we're not going to talk about those today. What we're going to talk about is the climate change adaptation services um, that uh, we've, we've put on. So how we're adapting to a changing climate. And so one of the pictures, I'm going to use some icons here in terms of what the um, adaptation means. One of the pictures on the left here is a, a very provocative picture of uh, boats being stranded in the Oral Sea. You know, has, and often been put out for you know, the need to adapt to a changing climate. This isn't a, an, a changing climate. Um, uh, it's a overstripping of resources, the use of uh, the water for irrigation was much greater than uh, what could be replenished. Um, and that, you know, is, is um, we're not talking about the irresponsible use of resources. What we're talking about is how you can look at changes to extreme weather, long-term changes in the climate, and how that's going to affect your operations. And the icon of a scale we'll get back to later because it's very much a balancing act of uh, preparing for an uncertain future right now, investing in infrastructure now, or reacting to the changing um, climate in the future. The um, International Council on Mining and Metals uh, has recognized that this is an issue facing the mining sector globally. Um, in 2003, they released a document uh, that outline the need for the mining sector to look at adaptation and why the adaptation is um, a, of significant um, uh, importance to the mining sector given that mines are located where the uh, resources are, not um, uh, you know, in a convenient location. Sometimes mines can be in some of the most extreme parts of the world, on tops of mountains, in deserts. Um, in uh, areas where there's too much water. The climate um, is uh, very important in terms of the mine design and the long-term uh, operation and the closure of a mine. And um, that was recognized by the ICMM. And there's a framework within uh, this document uh, outlining what the problem is. The issue, and moving forward, is how do you address those problems when they are very site-specific to the local climate and to the local um, uh, uh, geography of the area. Um, there is additional documentation um, uh, in Canada. Our uh, natural resources um, uh, section of the, of the government, NRCAN, uh, has invested a lot of um, effort in uh, helping various sectors, including the mining sector, with adaptation. Um, they have done a series of um, regional adapt 
effective collaborations uh, where different areas within uh, the country looked at different aspects, mining, communities, um, uh, uh, water resources, and from the original um, uh, re regional adaptative collaborative the RAC process, they have now developed some working platforms. Mining in the northern um, uh, platform is a specific sector. Um, there's a, a working group looking on issues for uh, mines, and one of the reports that came out of this was how mining is treated at the planning stage um, and how uh, some, I think there was about 30 or 40 um, mines that were taken from uh, feasibility into operations through the environmental social impact assessment uh, and what was done well, what was done, um, uh, what were areas of improvements, and the development of best management practices to support the climate adaptation for the mining sector. So this was a report that came out um, uh, last year and is a good reference document document in terms of this provides some how-to in terms of uh, conducting these environmental social impact assessments. So let's look at uh, the implementation of this guidance and the best practices around climate change adaptation. It's very important when we look at the adaptation uh, measures to look at the life um, span and the mining cycle of a facility. The considerations at a small mine that may be in operations for uh, 10 to 15 years um, that isn't going to have a significant closure. Maybe it's an underground mine. There won't be uh, any tails um, generated as part of the process. It's just in, uh, producing uh, ore. Um, you know, those issues are going to be much smaller than a large mine that's going to have a lifetime of 50 or more years, a world-class uh, facility that also has um, uh, concentration, some um, uh, improvements of the ore, and then possibly uh, smelting or refining at the facility as well. So those, the, the operations that occur at the uh, site are going to be very dependent in terms of what the adaptation considerations are going to be. But if you break down the mine, every mine goes through uh, these series of steps, and it's the closure and the operations where the consideration of the climate and the infrastructure are the most important. Another way of looking at that is in looking at a project uh, life cycle, um, and each of these stages, the planning, design, operations, and closure, whether is important to the operation and the design of many of the aspects of the mine. Um, I've listed a number of them here. And at Golder, where we provide environmental um, uh, social impact assessment services, but we also do work in terms of the, the engineering at the, the mines themselves, in terms of, of tailing dam design, foundation design, material specifications. And this is, again, why our tech community is, exists is how we can share this information amongst uh, externally but also internally. How when we are uh, looking at uh, our design for a facility, how do we make sure we're using the best available information and considering the changes and extreme weather events that may occur in the future. So we've taken this, this approach to um, uh, the, the mining. It is also applicable to other infrastructure and other social um, and environmental uh, site assessments that can look at these types of, of operations. So we're using mining as an example here. However, I do think the, the approaches that uh, we're talking about here are not exclusive to mining by any means. So where do we get the uh, information? Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been preparing uh, reports uh, for a number of years that talk about the uh, science, the need to assess, um, model the, the uncertainties of the future, um, and there's a lot of information out there right now. One of the hurdles that we've had in the past 
is we recognize this is a problem, however we don't have enough information to, um, uh, to, to make a decision moving forward. There's too much uncertainties. Given the wealth of the information um, uh, that's available through the IPCC, I don't think you can say there isn't enough information out there. In, in fact, I think the problem is just the opposite, is there's almost too much information um, and so uh, in order to make decisions, if you aren't um, uh, strategic in the way that you present the information, the way that you distill the information, you can actually be overcome by too much information. Um, and an example of that is uh, a figure from uh, the IPCC documents themselves. So these are uh, the uh, global circulation model outputs using the new um, representative concentration pathways that uh, look at the um, concentration of GHGs and other forcings, atmospheric forcings in the um, environment that are going to change the climate over the coming years. The uh, changes in temperature and precipitation are the uh, best modeled uh, variables that are coming from the uh, GCMs. And you can see from a global perspective that, that you know, depending on the concentration pathways, the um, RCP 8.5 is a greater concentration of carbon dioxide and other GHGs in the future. Uh, 2.6 is a lower concentration. There are, are different outputs from the model. So there is uncertainty coming out. But the point, getting back to the, the information, is how do you take this information and, and apply it to your uh, individual project? This is a, on a macro scale. It's, it's you know, very interesting from that perspective. But how do you then translate this information to usable information that can be um, uh, used in your planning, design, or operations assessment? And again, that's where there is a lot of information out there, but it's now distilling that information into a more usable form. So the next slides that I'm going to go through are uh, three ways that we like to a gold or present this information to make the information more usable and more understandable to the people that need to use this information, the engineers, the uh, planners, the operators at the facility that can then um, look at what the important aspects from this data are. So the scatter plot on the left is looking at uh, the outputs from the GCM models. This used IPC um, uh, uh, assessment report number four. So there we were using, instead of the representative concentration pathways, we were using economic scenarios. But the, the approach is the same, so the A1B or the A2 and then the different models. And what that shows is for the 2050s, so the next climate normal period, uh, we have plotted uh, the diamond is the um, observed trends in the past 30 years, the climate normal from uh, 1980 to uh, 2010 or from 1970 to 2000. Um, and then the other figures are the outputs from the other models. So there is some general consensus that in the area where we've uh, uh, got this data, Sudbury, Ontario, an area important for mining in Canada, um, there's a general trend uh, that it's going to be warmer and wetter and that that is represented by the trend over the last few years. So what people have experienced over the last 30 years is likely to occur for the next uh, 30 years. So, um, but when we break that down, when we look at, that's the annual changes in a percentage of precipitation on the X and um, temperature um, degrees in the Y. When we look at the values for the summer months here in uh, Canada, so um, uh, there's a lot more um, difference in the uh, values. There's, there's much more uncertainty. Um, and, you know, convective thunderstorms that uh, happen in Canada in the summer in Ontario, you know, those are very, a, um, can be very hard to predict currently, and you can see that that uncertainty is represented in the models moving forward. And, the, again, the diamond now has, has looked at that it isn't a warmer and wetter summer, it's a warmer but um, 
uh, actually a little bit drier summer that has been uh, observed over the past 30 years. And then the data, some of the models say that that's the, the case and some is not. So again, it's important to look at the data in a, in, a, in a level of detail in order to make it understandable to make decisions for. Another way we look at this data is uh, what we refer to as a cloud graph. So on the, um, the dotted line, um, uh, represents the actual observed annual temperature um, for the previous 30 years. And then the cloud is the range of the outputs from the um, models. And what you can see is with the exception of, you know, maybe less than 10, less than 30 percent of the, the data, um, the um, 95th percentile of the outputs are actually above the historical observed calculation, uh, observed um, records. So at some point in the future, it's likely to be warmer and more than what is typical in Sudbury. And that's been, you know, rep represented when the climate does change from what was expected in the past. So the data for this area, um, you know, the cloud is not always above the uh, observed values, but it does only reach the highest of the observed values. So again, using this data, we can say it's likely to be warmer in this area. Um, I, we have similar data for precipitation. We can break this down on um, uh, seasonal or monthly values as well. So you can gain more insight into the trends. Another way is to look at a histogram assessment of the data. So here, we have the um, orange line is a histogram of the observed data uh, based on the annual temperatures. And then the blue bars and the dashed line are a histogram of the projected data. Now, we've scaled them to the same um, uh, uh, size. We've only got 30 years of data in the normals. And we have um, many more. Uh, uh, outputs from the models because we're using some 24 GCMs and different um, uh, economic scenarios. So we have a number of uh, more observation points for the future data. But you can see that, that um, if we assume a, a normalized distribution for both data sets, there's a peak-to-peak -peak shift. And again, there's where we can look at what the change in temperature is likely to be between the observed normal uh, and the future normal with some uncertainty, and that uncertainty can be seen in the tails of that distribution. So we're getting more information, we're getting more information on a, on a scale that can be usable by um, the people that need this data. Uh, we can then in turn break this down on monthly um, data and look at the change between the observed um, uh, climate normal, the projected mean from all of the uh, data uh, from the uh, GCMs, and then the range of the data. And it follows a pattern based on temperature, but there is significant uncertainty in terms of models for uh, precipitation. So taking all of this information, being able to, to have a discussion with um, uh, the operators, the designers, um, the planners, then we can um, uh, start to look at what the impacts of climate are going to be on the project. Um, and then we can do this, this histogram on um, uh, a, a um, monthly basis as well. And the, the point here that we I put in there is, again, that the distribution between the future and the uh, observed climate for any given month can be uh, different, uh, as, as seen by the lower um, uh, histogram for precipitation in June, one of the uh, summer months. So we've got our data set. Now how do we then um, uh, use that in our planning and design if we are going to do an environmental um, and social impact assessment? So we've looked at the observed climate, the historical record. We have looked at the projected climate and the uncertainties around that. And now we're looking at how those can impact uh, on the project. We also, going back to the, to the GHGs, we're also looking at how the project can impact climate itself in terms of what the GHGs are coming from. Uh, but we'll just focus on the lower one is the impact of, uh, or the impact of climate change on the project. And through a, um, a assessment of significance and looking at how that uncertainty moves forward, 
uh, we can look at the assessment of significance on the uh, project. So here in Canada, our uh, Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency, SIA, has had requirements for um, uh, many years um, that you look at the effect of the project on climate, but also the uh, changing environment on the project. And so that um, OCARE and report that I talked about, the best uh, practices in uh, mining, there was about 40 mining projects since 2004 that has gone through the review. Now, not all of them follow the same level of effort, but there is a, um, uh, you know, it is now an accepted assessment process. You know, again, we wouldn't consider doing a uh, ESIA without having this component, much like we wouldn't consider doing an ESAA without a, a human health risk assessment, um, so to speak, in terms of the work that we're doing here in Canada. So let's talk about a example that, um, uh, that was done through um, the SIA process. So the Meliadine uh, Gold Project um, is a project by Agnico Eagle. They're a Canadian gold mining company. And uh, it's located in uh, Nunavut, which is uh, Canada's newest territory in the eastern Arctic. Um, uh, Inuit owned uh, territory um, and is, uh, has a lot of mineral um, resources. Uh, this uh, project is close to one of Agnico Eagle's existing mines, the Meadowbank uh, mine and is a area that is um, uh, tundra, lots of water, um, uh, you know, annual temperature below, um, uh, annual average temperature below zero, um, Arctic, uh, very dry, um, and uh, we completed an environmental social impact assessment in 2003. Uh, climate change was, uh, sorry, 2013, climate change was an important uh, component uh, of this and went through a number of uh, technical disciplines from the uh, tailing storage facility design uh, to biology. And uh, what we were able to do following that approach of um, the, uh, the climate data, the uncertainties, we provided that data to each of the technical disciplines and they then in turn looked at how uh, that uncertainty, that the change in climate was going to affect their operations. So um, it was in the design for the permafrost in the waste rock piles to show that there would be freeze back of the uh, process uh, and that um, although there was a change in climate, it was not um, so much that it would affect the um, uh, uh, design of the facility. In addition, uh, the biologists took a look at this and did a cumulative effects assessment of how the project and a change in climate may affect the caribou herds. This is an area where the caribou are uh, ranging throughout um, the uh, area and uh, that was also part of the assessment and that the, the, the project was a small component to the overall cumulative effects that were going to affect uh, the caribou. So it was accepted by um, uh, the Nunavut Impact Assessment Board, and um, it's you know I think it's a good um, example of how climate change can be incorporated in a, an environmental site assessment. The other aspect I want to touch on is operations and closure. So this would be uh, either at the design phase or maybe at a site that has been in operations for some time and um, is dealing with weather and uh, extreme weather climate and now wants to know how the changes, the projected changes, are going to uh, affect that in the future. And so we've developed a, a vulnerability assessment approach um, for these facilities. Um, and uh, it, it, there's a lot, again, some mining specific guidance. I've provided a um, link to some climate change case studies specifically on mining. But the process has also been followed in other areas for public infrastructure, for municipalities, and there's various uh, vulnerability assessment frameworks that look at um, climate change as a function of risk. And I want to talk about one specifically that we were involved in is the Sudbury Integrated Nickel Operations um, in Ontario and Canada, 
um, that was completed and is actually one of the case studies that's written up um, uh, by NRCAN for um, as an example of how mining can deal with a changing climate. So the integrated nickel operations, they uh, have been in operation for approximately 100 years uh, since the discovery of nickel in the Sudbury area. Um, the uh, Falcon Bridge smelter uh, located just outside of the, the, in the greater Sudbury area, outside of the downtown Sudbury area, uh, has had mines on the site for 100 years. The uh, smelter now consists of uh, roasting operations, an electric arc furnace, a converter aisle uh, that produces a nickel mat, and then that nickel mat is then shipped off site to be refined into nickel at another site. Um, so this has had a lot of water management. Um, uh, you can see that the site is, is there's, it's water rich. Um, the, uh, it's integrated with a nickel mine, the uh, Nickel Rim South operations that are outside of this picture but close. And um, they identified that, mm -hmm. hey, climate change could be, is an issue that we have to develop. And how they had a corporate social responsibility obligation to say, develop an adaptation strategy. So um, they, in order to, to meet their obligation to develop this adaptation strategy, they asked themselves these four questions. Um, you know, how is climate change going to impact the business operations? How can this be integrated into the existing risk register, the risk framework? Um, uh, Extrata, Glencore, um, when we started this uh, facility, but now Glencore has a very well-developed, like most mining companies, risk register that is um, the way they manage uncertainty. You know, uncertainty in many things and climate being another uncertain um, risk fit very well in that uh, risk framework. Um, they wanted to know how they can uh, build uh, adaptive capacity and make their operations um, uh, more robust in the future, and what actions do they have to take right now? What are the risks that they have to act on right now? So the way that we looked at this is we looked at the climate factors, the rain, the um, other uh, aspects, um, temperature at the facility, extreme conditions, what were the infrastructure components, the water systems, the um, uh, other operational systems at their facility, and we looked at uh, the interactions between the two. If there was no interaction between climate and one of their um, uh, infrastructure, then we didn't have to assess it. Where there was a, an, a, an interaction, then we had to assess that for significance and uh, look at the risk uh, for those interactions. And so we used the um, Public Infrastructure Engineering uh, Vulnerability Committee process, the PIVC process that was developed by Engineers Canada. Um, it was developed for public infrastructure, but it, 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 it applies to all infrastructure. So we took the best parts of the PIVC process and then applied it to Glencore's operations. Um, the, uh, it's a heat map, um, uh, a risk uh, process that looks at uh, probability and consequence or severity. Um, it was a, it's a, um, a zero to seven, so an eight by eight uh, matrix. Glencore used a five by five, so we, I've got the PIVC process here, um, but you know, it can be translated into a smaller matrix. Um, and there are some unacceptable risks identified by REDS, some uh, caution areas, and then some risks that are considered um, acceptable. So let's take this as an example of um, we've got a, uh, a flooding uh, condition um, that is negligible or very improbable. You know, a one in a hundred, a one in uh, a, a greater uh, return period that is going to happen. That it's a low probability but high consequence uh, event. So under uh, the design conditions, this was considered, but not, you know, it was, it, it isn't something that's going to happen. You know, based on climate change, but also the development um, of the facility over time, uh, as new systems were added, as, as production uh, capacity was increased, the same systems were asked to do more, which also puts a stress on the uh, infrastructure. Now that same uh, weather event, 
is um, uh, could be more probable. Um, and so now that has to be addressed in terms of the consequences. Severity has to be reduced through the adaptation. So now that's just a rain event. So what we're looking at in the top is the vulnerability assessment, is identifying the climate, the infrastructure, and the changes in the uh, probability. And then the risk mitigation was what is the adaptation that has to occur in order to um, uh, that we went through. Um, we looked at a climate factor, temperature, rain, snow, wind, mixed events. We looked at classes of infrastructure um, that was, were important uh, by developing this through a workshop where we involved various members of um, Glencore uh, team, their environment, their operations, their engineers, their designers, their economic people, um, and looked at where there is an interaction. These infrastructure components were further broken down uh, into subcomponents, and uh, we were able to look at the risk, and again there was a range because we asked people what their perceived risk was and asked people with different perspectives um, and then average that risk both under the current climatic conditions and the future climatic conditions to identify um, uh, the priorities. And then that in turn was then brought back into Glencore's risk register and we identified some clear um, areas uh, for further investigation. One of those was the water balance um, and uh, the, we're already identifying issues at the site in terms of it wasn't operating. The standard operating practices had to be updated to deal with the current climatic conditions. We took advantage of a um, probabilistic uh, tool, the gold sim model that we had developed for the water balance that ran both deterministically using the past 30 years of climate data we calibrated the model, but then we were able to say in the future, how is this going to, what are the, the stresses on the system, um, and how could the, the system react to other um, uh, rain events. So the first assessment was done using the current uh, IDF curves, uh, intensity, duration, and frequency, that, that represented the current climate and looked at the range of weather that still met the, the existing not normals, the rules, and then we changed those uh, um, rules to say that that could represent the outputs from the GCM models and how that would test the uncertain future. So I won't share the exact uh, outputs from those GCMs, but looking at that, uh, you know, in the future there may be less snowpack, greater rainfall, um, so that had to be put into the water balance. And the designs this, that had a design stress um, based on that, or there could be you know we have current um, water levels at a certain point within the system, um, higher in the um, uh, flows um, in the winter and then lower in the summer, um, and that uh, increased um, temperature may uh, increase the evaporation and look at uh, dry periods. And so, you know, we've got a plan for new patterns. And again, the output from this tool was important in terms of that planning. So this really worked very well in terms of uh, identifying risk. But the next um, uh, area that we needed to tackle was how does that mean? How do you then make decisions moving forward? And getting back to our scales, um, it's dollars. We wanted to translate the um, output from these models from the risk process into some cost-benefit analysis to say is it better to invest in the infrastructure now um, or is it better to react, uh, cope with the, uh, use the current coping mechanisms and then look at adaptive measures at some time in the future when the uncertainty is reduced where you know what the weather is going to be. Um, so we, again, changed the, uh, the risk diagram now into um, uh, a, a risk triangle where um, if the adaptation costs were low, so there's less risk for um, an event happening, um, and the um, uh, uh, 
um, the adaptation, the climate risks were low, then you know that, that that's something to 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 you know you're not taking actions. If the adaptation costs were very high, and uh, the coping costs are low, but the the risk is low, then again you know we're saying that that's probably a time to wait. Where the risk of um, uh, the climate event occurring and causing an event, and then the coping costs are high, but it's not high for the, uh, the, the adaptation, that that's where it makes sense to do this adaptation. So we were able to develop this type of a, a decision-making framework to say, where do we need to refine the inputs, or based on the information we have right now, where does it make sense to invest your scarce dollar uh, moving forward? So we looked at different climate events, and again, this isn't um, this is from a different facility, not the Glencore facility, um, but another facility that we we developed a case study for. We looked at different climate events uh, that could occur in the future. We looked at the probability of them occurring under the current climate conditions, the probability of them occurring under future climate conditions in terms of risk bins, what the costs were for the infrastructure being affected, what the social costs are going to be, and the reputational risks in terms of affecting um, uh, the environment, uh, the reputational risk. And we were able to put this, again, in a, in a probabilistic tool to look at what are the chances of um, you know, that dollar in, in uh, adaptation being a good investment now over the next 10 or 40 years. And the output from this, we developed a, um, a, I think, a simple graphical way of looking at that, where the payback wasn't achieved, where you know, investing a dollar now to adapt to the climate trigger um, over the next 10 years, the first one, it, it, it under the 10 years, and we ran a thousand realizations of the next 10 years, and then summed up the number of times we received the payback and the number of times where the internal rate of return for the dollar invested was not met. For the second climate event, the adaptation costs were lower, the risks were higher. There, payback was achieved and so adaptations preferred. And you can see for the different uh, climate events and the different infrastructure components that we were looking at that climate events and maybe those climate events would have different affect different infrastructure components but for the ones that we looked at uh, some uh, payback was was uh, achieved it's a case to do with adaptation some is is cope and wait and see others are are more in the middle and especially when you look at over the next 40 years, assuming that the adaptation measure was done in year one and then you looked at the effects over the next 40 years, the longer period changes that a little bit more. And so now we've got a, um, a dialogue where we've taken this from the uncertainty into a risk management framework that deals with uncertainty and now in a cost-benefit analysis where you're actually making a, um, a decision based on the metric of dollars investment whether you should be taking action now or deferring that action. And we hope to, to move forward with these case studies to, to uh, do a little bit more work with uh, Glencore in terms of refining the emission, uh, refining the inputs to the model and being able to better um, document where payback is achieved and not. So in summary, um, the climate change impact assessments, I don't think there's any reason to say we can't do that anymore. There's information out there. There are best practices that have been developed for Canada, for other areas that are showing that there's a, a path forward that you, by um, looking at the uncertainty, embracing the uncertainty in terms of the multi-model ensemble um, and the range of future predictions, you can make it a decision that it can be um, directly translated into an environmental assessment framework in terms of valued components and a significance assessment. And um, you can then also, if you are, have enough information, actually break that into a dollar economic assessment as part of an EA as well to show uh, whether these actions are uh, both from a risk and a significance assessment, but also from a dollar perspective. 
And I think we need to look at uh, better adaptive management strategies and how we can document um, the decision to say, in this case, we are investing in infrastructure, we've got it in our design, and in other cases, uh, we're going to um, uh, adapt. Uh, but at some point in the future, we're going to uh, have a strategy and we're going to monitor the changes and then we've got it in our plan that we can make these changes in the future. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, uh, Anna Maria, and um, uh, see if anybody has any questions. Well, I'm not sure if Anna Maria has her audio back, um, but now we can see her on our webcam. Um, we will go ahead and um, field any questions that you may have. If you have questions, you can post them in the questions box uh, on the control screen, um, and we'll go ahead and um, pose those to Sean. Um, before we do that, while you're thinking of your questions, we do have a really quick poll we'd like to, to ask you. Um, we'll go ahead and launch that now. Um, we're wondering how likely you would be to participate in another webinar on mining and climate change focus, um, uh, focused on case studies from another country. We're looking at doing something similar to this on a, in a series uh, that we already have a potential, um, I think we're looking at Australia uh, as the next one and we're, uh, this was just a test basis for us um, seeing how, how this worked and how well it was received and, and perhaps moving forward making it into a series. We'll give it a few more seconds and then we'll close the poll and we will move on to the questions. All right, so I'll go ahead and close the poll in three, two, one. Thank you, everybody. Anna Maria, do we have your audio back? No. So um, the one of the questions was, uh, was wondering if any of this will be presented at II 15. Sean? Yes. <laughs> um, we, there is a, um, uh, a uh, mining and climate change adaptation uh, panel uh, at um, uh, IAIA 15. Um, Golder has a paper, um, a colleague from our uh, UK, uh, European office is going to be presenting and will be providing um, some uh, experiences uh, contrasting the uh, Canadian experience with experience in both Africa and South America. And there's other um, uh, other uh, discussions as well. There's other presentations on uh, mining and climate change as well. Um, okay, I found my audio again. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, are there any other questions that you would like to type into the question box? We still have some minutes left. Uh, Phil says that they're really good examples so practitioners can see what has been done and is possible. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Wes asks, uh, is Golder looking at planetary boundary issues? I'm, I'm not sure what, uh, what the question uh, is asking about planetary boundary issues. Yeah, Wes, if you could uh, elaborate a little bit on this. Uh, Fernando also asks, uh, can we have the Goldism model or an example of it? Uh, yes. Um, so uh, 
Uh, GoldSim is a, um, uh, a modeling company. Um, they sell their model. Um, it's available. Um, it is a stochastic tool that um, is uh, the, the value in it is it's easy to program relations um, so you can quickly create these stochastic relationships between um, different things. It's not necessarily a hydrological modeling tool. Uh, people use it for many different assessments. Um, so GoldSim was just a model that we had chosen to build the um, water balance for the system um, because of its um, uh, stochastic um, uh, capabilities. And uh, you know we, we we refer to it as a golden weather generator um, that we built an, an ad app that can go right in there to do this um, uh, generate these these weather data systems. So it's available. Um, there's other um, uh, tools uh, that uh, we've used for stochastic. It's just one of the tools. For example, when we developed the uh, economic assessment, um, Goldson was a bit. It was more sophisticated than we used. So there we just used the at risk addition to Excel and programmed all those relationships in Excel and then just used at risk to run the um, realizations for the next 40 years a thousand times and quickly sum up the uh, results. So it's the, um, I mentioned those models um, uh, just as, as tools to use, right? But the thinking process behind it of being able to establish those relationships and um, uh, test them through uh, the um, uh, probabilistic assessment is, is the, the important part. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, the next question would be, uh, who should we contact in order to have more technical and uh, detailed studies or, um, yeah, or some example of it? Well, I, this uh, presentation will be made available through the IAIA, and I'd be happy to send it out to anybody who wants to reach out to me. Um, the um, uh, so, and I think that if the polling question was was good, then the IAIA will be having more of these types of sessions uh, to answer that question. So, if you have any questions on what I presented, I'd be happy to uh, uh, discuss it further offline. And also, just a branch off that same question: Do we have data on studies in Africa on this? Um, we do have some. We we've done some um, uh, uh, assessments using using climate data, using adaptation, uh, climate change adaptation in Africa for the ESIAs that we have done. Um, it's my understanding that there is not a consistent requirement. Uh, for um, ESIAs in Africa, that if uh, it the ESIA is being done to IFC requirements, the International Finance Corporation, their performance standards, then their performance standards are quite clear that um, you have to consider the effect of a change in climate on the project. So those projects would have a similar assessment. Um, if the ESIA is being done to uh, local uh, requirements, then that would be dependent on the local requirements whether this would be included or not. Um, so there are some examples. We have an example of a, of a, um, a facility where we've done um, it in Africa, but I don't think it is as consistent as in Canada across the different African countries. Okay. And uh, Phil asked if this presentation will be shared and sent. It will be available on the IAIA website after this, the recording and the presentation slides. So just tune in there and you'll get them. And another question from Ahmad would be if you could talk about the CGM model and downscaling methods that they use for the case study. Okay, that, that's a good question, yeah. So, the um, we looked at a multi-model ensemble of the available global circulation models, and we extracted the data from these GCMs for the specific project location. So, in the the data that I showed you from Sudbury, uh, 
for the various GCMs, and there's about 24 of them that are, are um, uh, uh, well referenced. So we looked at the data outputs from each of the grid cells that represented the project location in Sudbury. So they would be different grid cells because they, of course, use different data. Um, and so we extracted that data and then looked at the um, uh, that data itself. We did not downscale that data for a more local uh, information from the GCMs. The GCM output typically is 300 by 300 kilometer grid scales, and uh, the, we took that data. Now, what we did do is we normalized the data from the GCMs so that uh, it was normalized to the observed normals at the facility. So we were looking at the baseline, and we then were able to then look at the uh, normalized it to change in temperature and change in precipitation from the observed normal from that area. So we didn't do any downscaling. It's possible, um, but one of the problems with downscaling, although you may get temporal resolution, the uncertainty is you know, you're not addressing the uncertainty. If you're only taking one model, you looked at the uncertainties between different models, you know, you're assuming that model is right and then um, getting more accurate, uh, more precise, sorry, temporal information, but it may not be more accurate. So we would prefer to spend our time uh, looking at a multi-model ensemble and dealing with the uncertainty than spending time downscaling um, and uh, although it gives you the temporal resolution, the probabilistic assessment, the other tools are ways that we can overcome the limitations on the temporal assessment in the current GCM. Okay, thank you, Sean. And Phil asks again, to what extent are the methods you use have been peer-reviewed and critiqued? So we've had our assessments reviewed by um, SIA. Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency and by the Nunav Impact uh, Review Board, and we've had them accepted. And Environment Canada, we've done some case studies with Environment Canada, and, and they've accepted the approach uh, as well. Okay. And Jill asks, these models often rely upon historical data, such as the, such as the data to develop 1 to 100 year floods. Uh, the ratio 1 to 100. Going forward with the climate changing, there is a view that many of the historical assumptions will no longer apply, as so the model predictions are perhaps a bit more uncertain. How will the models take this into account? Well, that's, that's the big question. So um, the uh, 1 in 100 year flood, it's a typical way of looking at the intensity, duration, and frequency curve, the IDF curve. That was the question we had in the water balance. So we, it's observed data. How can we take that, that information and move it forward? So we did do some assessment of how the IDF curves have changed in Sudbury over the past you know, 50 years that we've got observed data. And they have changed. Environment Canada has <coughs> updated the IDF curves over that time. And then we looked, and so there's a change in the different return periods. And then we looked at the outputs from the GCMs, this multi-model ensemble, and then said, how could those IDF curves change um, in the future? And it, it, depending on the infrastructure component, there isn't a, just a one-size-fits-all um, uh, solution. For the reservoirs, which are long um, retention, large areas, it was the changes in the 24-hour, the longer return periods, that were most important. For localized flooding culverts, it was the 15-minute um, storm that was most important um, and the changes there. So we had to look at the different infrastructure components, different risks, and that's where um, it, we, we applied some judgment um, and uh, looked at what those risks were for the different climate events and then inputted that into our uh, cost-benefit tool. So it, 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 you know, again, if people say, I want a uh, IDF curve that's going to be accurate in 50 years. We're never going to get that. In, um, uh, in absence of that accuracy, we can deal with the uncertainty and make decisions moving forward. I mean, that's the, the, the point of this whole exercise is although there's uncertainty, you can still make 
you know, use this as a planning tool, an impact assessment tool moving forward. Okay, I hope that question was answered as well. And we have another question. When did this requirement of having changing climate assessments in EIA become legal in Canada? If you could give a reference if possible. Sure. So uh, the, the most uh, reference document was a document produced by, um, there was a federal committee on uh, climate change made up of both uh, CN and, the, and the, the provinces, and that document is circa 2003. And I can get a reference to that if, if we need that. Okay, sure, yeah. So that um, but was not a legal requirement. Well, it's a legal requirement in the um, in setting the terms of reference, if you will, for the environmental social impact assessment, the first stage in, in CS process is to develop ESIA guidelines. So those guidelines are developed by the agency, accepted by the proponent, and then become the basis for the review. So we have been seeing a very consistent um, EIS guidelines from the regulators saying, you have to do this in order to satisfy our requirements. So there isn't a law that says you have to do that, but in the guidance, most of EA is not law. The EA is you have to do an EA, and then the approach and the scope of work is dependent on the uh, uh, project, and it's defined in the EIS guidelines. Okay, Phil, I hope that was a bit more clear for you. So I think that will be, we'll wrap it up here. That was the last of the questions. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming, for attending our virtual webinar. Uh, and thank the IAIA um, for putting this together and Sean for taking the time to present the Canadian experience on mining and climate change. So uh, keep uh, stay tuned for further webinars and we hope to see you soon at the next IAIA.